Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. My name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question. Jeff. Yep. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing okay. Doing all right. Yeah. Weather's weather's getting on the colder side, but that hasn't uh, hasn't been too bad. It's been uh, cold. It's been it snowed a couple times, but nothing uh, nothing that really stuck. Right. Yeah. So it's still not even technically winter yet. So. <laughs> yeah. Argue <laughs> arguably yes. <laughs> that's the that's the weather chat for this episode. <laughs> I guess. I guess. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Just uh, yeah. I don't have a don't have a ton going on at the at the moment. Just kind of wait waiting for the next holiday is basically it. Just kind of yeah, pre- prepping for holidays. And the sad thing is this coming holiday isn't really going to be much special because yeah, we're not you know, going you know, to be hanging out with family and such. Right. Yeah. So, you're, yeah, you got to make you got to make those adjustments. And yeah. yeah. But uh, other than that, yeah, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I I talked to my um, my union representative at work and I'm going to I'm going to try to switch to a different job. Um, starting in not, not like a different employer. Like I'm still going right. to be at my same workplace, Yeah. but, um, my job for the last, uh, I've been working the same job for basically the last three years and I'm on my feet, you know, all day, every day. And it's, uh, I've enjoyed it. It hasn't really been a problem until about a year ago. I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the, the normal podcast. I know I've mentioned it in the, some of the supplemental Patreon stuff that's, that's been on there, but um, I have like a, a, a pain in my foot that I've had for about a year mm. and I've been going to a podiatrist for a few months. I've been getting like weekly injections in my heel to try and try and fix the problem. And it's, um, it hasn't really, I mean, it's, it's still there. I right. guess it's less bad than it was a few months ago. I think, I don't know. It's like sure. the whole optometrist thing where it's like, is, you know, uh, number one or number two, number one, or two. number two or number three. Well, wait, wait, can we, can we go back to number one? <laughs> well, it's not substantially um, worse. <laughs> so it's correct. correct. So it has good. not gotten worse. Yeah. Um, but, but one of the, th- if, if I don't want to get surgery, which would be kind of like the nuclear option, if I don't want to get surgery in my mind, what I'm thinking is one of the best things I can do is just try to get a different job where I'm not on my feet all day. Right. It might take, it'll probably take six months, a year or something, if that's going to fix it. But, you know, the only way to do that is to not be working the job I've been working. So, yeah. Um, so next week they're supposed to, they're going to start um, canvassing. Like they're going to start going around asking who, who wants to sign up for other jobs and such. So I'm going to, going to try to get something over, over in a different department probably. Sure. 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 Yeah. So, so I guess check back in in six months and see how my foot's doing. Listeners. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. We'll see in six months or we'll see in like, you know, a decade when we're all, we'll all have like uh, robot bodies. So <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I've replaced most of my body with robot parts yet. I still have the same heel. <laughs> I still have that problem, but now I've got like, you know, a, a metal frame that comes out of my right leg that <laughs> accounts for it. <laughs> Your Gabe's heel. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh man, to be to be a part of you know the equivalent of Greek myth in a couple thousand years, <laughs> right? Um. So one thing that I want to I want to clarify a couple episodes ago, I told I put a little little stinger at the beginning of the episode saying that uh, we were going to be having a listener submissions episode coming up soon, and the d- the deadline was Christmas. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I did a very good job of explaining what it was I wanted because the on, pretty much the only submissions I've gotten so far were uh, not what I was looking for. So I guess let me try and clarify that a little bit. So we're not going to be doing a normal episode. It's it's not going to be our normal, you know, Dragon's Horde and then questions and then uh, and then funeral pyre segments. It's it's I'm not sure exactly what form the episode is going to take just yet, but think of it like an off-topic episode. Or maybe like a behind the scenes episode kind of. But one of the main draws that I wanted was think of it like you can put your voice on the podcast. You have an opportunity to record something yourself, really anything you want, as long as it is is in any way relevant to us or the podcast or our listeners. If you want to record something, you could record like a shout out to one of your friends. You could record uh, a backstory of one of your characters 
or maybe like, maybe you think that we were wrong about something that we <laughs> did and you, maybe you want to complain about how good the Tarask is or something like that. Oh, I'd love that. Go for it. <laughs> you know, anything like that, whatever, if there's anything that you would like to record and then have on the podcast for the rest of time or the rest of however long our hosting continues, right? then that's, that's what that's for. But also, um, if you don't have a mic or for whatever reason, you just really don't want your voice on there. You can also do something in this, in a, a similar vein, but have us, if you want to write something out, you can send it to us and we'll read it or something. Let's say you have a, a short story you wrote or, uh, I don't know, something like that. Like I've had people say like, oh yeah, here's some discussion questions for your listener submissions episode. And you know, we're not doing, that's not what we're doing on that episode. Cause that's what we do every episode. We always do listener submitted discussion questions, listener submitted sure. magic items. Yeah. So f- of course, please keep sending us those, but that's not what we were planning on for that episode. I, I don't know if I made that in any way clear, in which case I apologize. It's, it's not a super, uh, uh, intuitive thing i guess right just you know if there's something that you would like to to verbalize on our podcast we're giving you the opportunity to do so Mm -hmm. so so that's what that's for if you want to record something anything send it in to us and and it'll probably go up on on the show and we'll have other stuff to talk about that episode at this point i don't expect to have an entire episode's worth of listener submissions we'll have some other fun stuff to to you know, to put out there in, in the meantime. But I, I just thought it'd be cool to get as many listeners as possible to just send in like, you know, hey guys, great job with the show. Or, <laughs> hey guys, you suck. Right. You know, we'll take maybe, we'll, maybe less of, of that one. <laughs> we'll take that as we'll, we'll take those as long as they're not too explicit, you know? <laughs> I suppose. I suppose if like, <laughs> sure. Hey, if you really want to tell us how much we suck, Go for it. Right. Yeah. I won't stop you. <laughs> yeah. You don't do a, do a roast, roast kind of situation. That's fine. Too. I mean, sure. Just keep sure. it tasteful. I would be okay with that. <laughs> I, yeah. Keep it tasteful. Um, and I, I know it's, it's, uh, at, at this point, you know, the deadline is like, is less than two weeks away. So it, uh, it's cutting a little bit close. So I apologize. But, yeah. you know, yeah, just get something, record something, write something, send us something, and we will talk about it. Right. Something that is not our normal content, I guess. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. you want to go ahead and get into this episode? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> okay. So, Jeff, do you remember way back in the day, we used to have really simple Dragon's Horde intros? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But b- before you st- you kept trying to one-up yourself every episode? Pretty much. There wasn't like, you know, oh, and then, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then, oh, you realize this person was a dragon all along. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, our intros used to be really, uh, used to be really simple, and I... I kind of miss those days. So you know what we're going to do today, Jeff? What are we doing, Gabe? We're heading to the Dragon's Horde. Woo! So fittingly, today's magic item was submitted by the Beverage TVI Discord, and it is called the Iron Mask of Nostalgia. Aw. <laughs> this is a very rare, wondrous item. The product of a collaboration between elven bounty hunters and gnomish illusionists, these masks were designed with the safety of the prisoner, the bounty hunter, and society at large in mind. Manacles, ropes, and chains can all be used as weapons by crafty prisoners against their captors. Even worse, these traditional restraints serve as a constant reminder of who ensnared the prisoner and against whom retribution should be paid. Not so with the Iron Mask of Nostalgia. This blinding, full-faced mask is secured with bonds of magic. A creature that is fitted with an Iron Mask of Nostalgia must make a DC 18 intelligence saving throw. On a failure, the creature's mind is transported to experience its favorite memory as it is remembered, opposed to how it really happened, rendering the creature physically incapacitated for 16 hours. On a success, the creature is aware that it is captive and aware of its surroundings, but takes 5d10 psychic damage as a result of knowingly losing all memories of the person they love, respect, or fear the most. What? The creature can choose to fail the saving throw. Each willing failure of a saving throw results in a permanent and cumulative negative one to intelligence. What? The creature can attempt a saving throw after each long rest. So yeah, this uh, is a like many of the magic items we've had on this. This is uh, 
either intentionally or unintentionally a torture device. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, those, those, this is, this is bonkers. Those mechanics are bonkers. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not saying they're bad, but they're just bonkers. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, you have to make a save. The save has a very high DC for right. fifth edition D and D. Yeah. And if you fail, you have a good experience, but you lose one intelligence well, permanently. No. If you fail, oh, you have a good okay. experience. This is why it's bonkers. If you f- okay. if you try to succeed and fail, you have a good experience. If you if you succeed, you have you take a lot of damage and lose a memory. If oh. you willingly fail, you lose one intelligence. Like Okay, yeah, that's worse than I that's that's scarier than I so thought. So the only good outcome, which is not a good outcome because you're incapacitated for 16 hours. Uh-huh. Is if you try to succeed, fail, and then you get no no permanent penalties, but you are in- incapacitated for sixteen hours, and who knows what's going to happen during that time? You know. Wow. Yeah. So That's... this, this, like, I'm not saying any of this is bad or unbalanced or anything, but it's so uh-huh. bonkers. It's like I I kind of like it because it's just sort of like there's a third option basically. Yeah. And like there's a third option, and no one none of the options are great <laughs> <laughs> pretty much yeah yeah okay okay yeah that's uh that's a little bit different than i than i first read it as but yeah that's that is terrifying mm-hmm. so you're like you're you are willingly giving up a piece of yourself you know like to to succumb to it you know to like to like let it let it overtake you yeah yeah but or you know so the idea is that like if you're fighting it but you fail you still fought it off to an extent like you still fought off any negative effects other than the fact that it's putting you under yeah so like it, it's sort of it's sort of like it, you fail the save but you take half damage still oh okay sure sure um yeah. like improved evasion back in third edition right yeah yeah so it's you know you're, you're failing the save but at least you're not taking the in, in intellect damage yeah. of just letting yourself fail sure but then like making the save like I feel like it's like you just you don't want to make the save and look a good thing it's like the high DC <laughs> like yeah yeah you kind of you want to fail but you can't let yourself fail right yeah it's, it's rough because yes yeah. that's quite a conundrum uh, on yeah on excess uh, on a success you are aware of the loss of a memory so wait what yeah uh oh wait no so like on, on. on a Oh, oh, okay. And a result, uh, uh, in, as a result of knowingly losing all memories of the person they love, respect, or fear most. So how can you knowingly lose a memory, though? <laughs> like, you know, I guess you know you lost to something. Yeah, you've had the moments where, like, you, you know you're forgetting something, but you don't sure. remember what it was. Sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's it's the like worst. like Neville with the remember all. Right, that's the worst. It's like I forgot. It says I've forgotten something, but I don't remember what it was that I forgot. You know. Yeah. So I, I guess when I had first read this, I, I thought that maybe there might have been a reason somebody would willingly put this on, like if they wanted to erase some of their own memories on purpose. But I guess uh, up, upon reading it, it's not really. It would be. It would be hard to do that. Mm. I guess. Yeah. Um. So doesn't quite work like that. But still, yeah. It's it's a it is a torture device. It is a severe punishment for um you know pretty much anybody i would say particularly spellcasters because if they especially if they do if a wizard gives in and starts taking the 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 yeah. start failing the the saves on purpose then you know they're not going to be a spellcaster for very long right yeah i like the theming of the um intelligence damage for willingly mm-hmm. uh doing it just because like the idea is like they put this on they try to make the save, they fail it, and then they are, you know, shown a, their favorite memory. And then, like, you know, and then every time after that, they're like, no, 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 I want to go back. You know, so that they're, yeah. giving, they're giving up. They're kind of like, you know, they get the, they're doing what, what parents always thought, like, you know, watching TV and, and, and playing video games is going to do <laughs> is, like, dumb people down. Yeah. Which, you know. They're rotting their brains because right. then when they try to make the save in the future, they'll always fail or they'll almost always fail. Right. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. So at a certain point, you don't need to willingly fail. You just don't have the you don't have the intelligence to to succeed anyway. I guess. Yeah. This is 
This is existentially terrifying. Right yeah, I here. mean a little bit, but at the same time, I'm like, you know what? <laughs> you know, it's like if my VR headset, you know, could play back my my favorite memories, like I would spend a lot of time in there. <laughs> yeah, before you know it, you would have, uh, you would have, you know, lost a whole bunch of points of intelligence, and then you're just trapped in a in a VR simulation for the rest of our lives. <laughs> And then, like robots will start using us for uh, as an energy source, and because that's how that works. Yeah, yeah. Because just the... sure, all right. Sure. Well, so I think uh, I think that's that's enough for this item. Thank you very much, uh, the beverage tea. Once again, that was the Iron Mask of Nostalgia. Uh, so Jeff, if anybody else wanted to submit magic items for us to discuss in the future, or if they wanted to submit uh, questions for our main segment or stories for the funeral pyre or retirement village. How would they get those to us? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com or join us on our interparty discord at bit.ly slash interparty discord. That is correct. And before we go any further, we have a giveaway to give away today. So uh, we're giving away a copy of Unearth Tips and Tricks Volume 2, courtesy of Crit Academy. It's a great supplement. Uh, contains 25 character concepts, 25 encounter concepts, monster variants, magic items, player tips and DM tips. Tons of stuff for players, tons of stuff for DMs. It's a great, great supplement. Lots of great stuff in there. So who is our winner of this great supplement today, Jeff? Oh, man. Our winner today is Alistar the Minotaur. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Winner. winner. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Yes, congratulations, Alistar. Um, he, his name, I think he was actually the first person to enter <laughs> for Unearth Tips and Tricks 2. So it's been on there for quite a while. Uh, so so yeah. uh, congratulations, Alistar. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it's worth the wait. I think yeah. it probably will be. Um, so when you get that, be sure to leave Crit Academy a review. The more reviews they have, uh, positive or negative, hopefully positive, the more reviews they have, the more attention they get, the more they know what to improve on in the future. Um, they've actually been doing for their Patreon kind of like a smaller form version of this where like I think it's once a month they come out with little chunks of those. So uh, so I guess also, you know, not not to, to send people away from our Patreon and over to somebody else's, but their Patreon has lots of good content and this is one one thing of it. So um, anyway, so yeah, congratulations, Alistar. Thank you, Crit Academy. Jeff, if anybody else wanted to be like Alistar the Minotaur, uh, maybe with without the horns. Yeah. <laughs> If they wanted to also win a copy of this great supplement, how would they do so? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with Unearthed Tips and Tricks, Volume 2 in the subject line. That is correct. And speaking of Patreon, I want to thank all of our wonderful patrons. Uh, for anybody who's not aware, Patreon is an online platform. You can pledge to donate a certain amount of money per month to the creator of your choice. And uh, if you donate to us, we have lots of different uh, rewards on there. We've got a few different tiers. We've got outtakes every month. I've got a bunch of fantasy fiction I've written in the past that's up there. Um, I've got uh, we've got some bonus episodes on there. We've got a bonus podcast, Interpatron Conflict, that we've been doing every month. Mm -hmm. um, we just put up, I actually just put up the one for December, and it includes some of our favorite recipes. Oh, yeah. That uh, that we talked about. And actually, Jeff, I forgot to tell you this before we started recording. Once we're done recording today, you know what I'm, I'm going to go make? What are you, you going to make? I'm going to go make uh, your chicken paprikash. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You sent me the recipe for that, so I'm going right. to try to make it today. Yeah, and like I was saying, like it's an older recipe, so it it, it calls for a, one of those like bouillon cubes or what are, what are it called? Yeah, I've got some equivalent. Yeah, basically, yeah. Like, I think you can use just like a stock or something like that. But it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's just like I keep for like I keep forgetting that that's in there, and I'm like, oh yeah, who 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 has those or uses those anymore? <laughs> we used to. We don't have any. We didn't have any now. I had to go and buy some. But uh, I it's I bought like it's basically like a little cube of stock, it's yeah. like a little jelly, like a little chicken base jello thing. Right. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, I'm really excited about that. So let's a little let's a little uh, preview of what we talked about in this month's bonus episode. We also last month put out like it's like a three hour long um, actual play of us playing through a horror RPG. Um, lots of good stuff on there. We've got like three years worth of of bonus episodes, so uh, covering a, a wide wide variety of topics. So yeah, go check those out. Um, we understand that money's tight for a lot of people right now, especially with the holidays coming around. If you can't donate or are unwilling to donate for whatever reason, we totally understand. If that ever changes, though, you know, let us know. You can get some cool stuff in return and help out the show. So big thank you to everybody who has uh, who has supported us during these times. You guys are awesome. All of you. 
And then uh, one more thing, check out the other podcasts on the Crit Nation Fellowship. I already mentioned Crit Academy. Check them out. Check them out at CritAcademy.com. They just did an episode on uh, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which is uh, is a great book. I got it for my birthday, and um, it's a great episode too. So go go check them out. Okay. Also check out Brute Force and Ignorance. They're an actual play podcast and uh, D and D Character Lab, where Garen and Dan made characters every week and pitted them against each other to debate whose characters were better. Both of those podcasts are either uh, have either ended or are on indefinite hiatus for the time being. And I'm not sure, not sure when like brute force and ignorance. I'm not sure when they're coming back. So, mm. but still yeah. they've got tons of episodes out there. You can still check out and it's, right. it's some great stuff. Yeah. Still worth checking out. Yeah. So anyway, enough of all that. Let's get into some questions, Jeff. All right. Our question comes from Stiltskin Kupo 84 on Reddit, And they ask, what are some items from video games you'd like to see in D and D? And what changes would you need to implement to make them work? Yeah, I feel like this is something that we've we've touched on in the past. I don't think we've ever done a specific question about it. Right. Yeah. But you know, I thought it'd be it'd be neat to have a, have an episode where we talk about some of our favorite uh, items and such from video games and see what we can come up with. Yeah, because I think we I think we've done something similar to like movies or something. Um, yeah. And because like you could, we could bring up the the lightsaber again. Because I mean, there oh, are... of course, shoot! I didn't even think of the lightsaber. Right. Let's are... just talk about the lightsaber for the next half an hour. Jeez. <laughs> oh, um, I mean, because you know, the, there are plenty of Star Wars video games with the lightsaber, but we, yeah. you know, we don't we don't need to we don't need to go into that too much anymore. But I mean, like that is one, like you know, sure. And every there are several different ways to implement it depending on what you what. Like what it is about a lightsaber that is like iconic to you. Yeah. You know, like somebody might just be like, okay, it deflect, it can deflect ranged attacks, you know, whether, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe it could deflect ranged attacks, whether spell or, you know, or mundane. And I, I should probably say that a lot of the, cause I, I tried looking at, you know, I brought up like a list of like, oh, hundred best uh, weapons or items from video games or whatever. And because I was, I was trying to think of like, what are, what are some cool items? Because this was actually, this was, was deceptively difficult to, to nail down a few items that I really think would be interesting to use in D&D. Yeah. Because the thing is, a lot of the items and weapons that you have in, D, in, in video games are only cool because either, number one, it's just iconic of the series. It doesn't necessarily do anything cool. Like, right. I'll say, the Master Sword from Zelda. What's cool about it? <laughs> I mean, I guess it's important to the story of Zelda, but right. what does it do? I mean, okay, in some of the games, it shoots a beam of whatever, but like, yeah, that's it. That's really all that's special about it. Right. Um, so so the, a lot of the things in, in games are only really cool because either they're iconic or because they're really powerful, mm-hmm. and that doesn't always really translate into D&D. Like with a lightsaber, one of the things that I love the most about a lightsaber is it cuts through anything. But how do you do that in D&D without, you know, w- w- pardon the pun, making Swiss cheese out of your game? You know, because if you're just cutting holes in everything. Uh, sure, yeah. Literally and figuratively, you're going to left with a bunch of Swiss cheese in your game. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's harder than it sounds. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, that's not... Uh... Yeah, you have to, you gotta set you gotta set rules you gotta set rules on down on it. Like I mean, like even even a lightsaber, and I know it's like it depends on which source material you're going with. Like you know, you're talking mm-hmm. about the movies, the prequels, the the extended universe books, which are no longer canon. The right, right. you know, the newer movies that are questionable. The, the like you know. um there are like the animated series and stuff like that. They like, they've added several different like weapons and materials that aren't affected by lightsabers the way everything else is. Sure. So it's like, yeah. You know, so, I mean, like you could, you could put some limits on it, you know, it's like, you know, if it's, uh, I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know. Like you could, you could have like a, it would like a, be like a thickness thing. Like the way that a lot of some like a div- divination spells and stuff work. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, anyway, so what? Um, I don't know. What? What? Are, what are? What are some items that uh, that come to mind? So one that definitely comes to mind, and I did not see this on any of the you know hundred best whatever in video games. I never saw this anywhere, but I think it's it was one of the best game experiences I've ever had. Is the Leviathan Axe from God of War? Um, Leviathan. I Axe. saw. Oh, the the newer God of War one. 
Yeah, yeah. Several of the lists included like the Chains of Chaos or whatever from the earlier God of War games. Right. And I guess that that's a cool weapon too, but actually playing the, you know, the 2018 or whatever. What year was it? 2018? Yeah, I think so. Uh, actually playing the most recent God of War game, the Leviathan Axe is so much fun to use. Mm-hmm. And I would love if there were a way to use it in a game like D&D. Because for anybody not who hasn't played this game, which is under, you know understandable, it's a PS4 exclusive. It was a fantastic game. I definitely recommend this game to anybody. But it is a game where the main character has this axe that it is ice elemental. So like there are certain things that uh, take more damage from it as opposed to other things. But it's an axe that you can you can swing it, you know, you can hit enemies with it. If you, certain enemies, if you hit them, they'll freeze, whatever. But also you can throw the ax and because the character is really strong, he can embed it in whatever, you know, he can like, you can throw it at a bunch of gears and they'll freeze, or you can throw it and hit an enemy with it and it'll stick in the enemy. And then you can call the ax back to you, similar to, you know, Thor's hammer Mjolnir. You can, uh, you can call it back to him from wherever. And so one of the cool things that this item does, this weapon does, is that you can throw it at an enemy and deal damage when it hits. You can call it back to you and it deals damage again as it rips itself out of them. But also if there is, if another enemy is between the two of you, when you call it back to you, it'll come back and hit the other enemy on the way back, Mm -hmm. which is so much fun because there's a, a tactical aspect to this. You can throw it hit one guy, then you can move so that, you know, another enemy's in the way, call it back, and then boom, you've done more damage to the first guy and damage to the second guy. And I just, I love that it's so much fun to play. <laughs> yeah. And it would be great to do something like that in D&D. Yeah, and it definitely looks like, because uh, I've seen I've seen clips of that game, and it's like, that looks ve- it looks visually satisfying too, because it's just, there's, yes. a, there's a good thunk to it when you call it back and... I can I can really tell the developers put a lot of work into the kinesthetics of it, like how it feels to use. Right. Some games do that, some games don't, and the games that do always just there's some indescribable fun of playing it. Yeah. And and that's definitely the case in God of War. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, that and that one that one wouldn't be too hard to to implement because I mean, there's already mm-hmm. like re- weapons of returning and stuff like that. You know, you can yeah have it be a throwing weapon. It just, it's just as simple as like, okay, like if you hit somebody with it, you can, you know, if you hit somebody with it, it sticks in them and then, you know, they can, they can take an action to take it out of themselves. But if they, you know, if they don't do that, you can on your next turn, call it back to you and it pulls out of them, does some damage. And if there's somebody in the way on the way back, they might take some damage too. Sure. I, I might say that because with the problem with and actually sorry let me let me correct you on something Jeff returning weapons are not a thing in fifth edition D and D oh sure I th- yeah. I thought they were but with the exception of specific weapons like the dwarven thrower there isn't just a plus one returning weapon right. in fifth yeah. edition but I mean like the the mechanics they're they're out there you know it's not sure it, w- sure. it wouldn't be difficult like it's not it's not it's not so hard to say okay you know you can you can use a bonus action to call it back to you or something yeah and like so i i wasn't trying to i'm not trying to correct you it's mm-hmm. like i was surprised to realize that this thing that i assumed was always a part of D D just wasn't there sure um because in in fourth edition any magic weapon just automatically returned to your hand immediately so you could if you had to use it three times in an attack you could um, in, in fifth edition, like I said, it's not really a thing. I had, a um, a couple of two of our patrons actually for our roll 20 game asked me about having a returning weapon. And I, I had to look and see that it wasn't, it wasn't in the book. So, hmm. um, so I, I think what I would do, cause in, in earlier editions, it would, a thrown weapon, a returning weapon would automatically, I think depending on the edition, it would either just instantly reappear in your hand or it would return in your hand at the end of your turn or something. What I would do if I was making the Leviathan Axe is I would make it so that it's an action to throw it. It deals, you know, however much damage, and then it sticks in the enemy. If they pull it out or if you call it back later, it deals, let's say, 1d6 cold damage to them when it gets torn out, whether it is intentionally or unintentionally Mm -hmm. and then it sticks in them until you use a bonus action to call it back but then 
when that happens, it comes to you in a straight line. So, uh, so you know, you can you can try and position yourself to use it at the best possible moment. So you'd spend an action to throw it, and then either move and then use your bonus action to call it back, or leave it there until next round. Use your bonus action then, and then you're using your bonus action to deal automatic damage. You know, because you already yeah. hit, you already stuck it in them, and then automatic damage, and then you know maybe the damage as it comes flying back to you, maybe maybe that would also be automatic. I, I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to mess around with it. Yeah, maybe like be like um, a reflex save for the person in between. Yeah, maybe. We um we had a, one of our bonus episodes. I talked about some of the ideas that I had for our actual play that we did last January. And um, because I had just played God of War, the one of the NPCs in that game was very much fashioned after, in some ways at least, after Kratos. And so the weapon he had was a fire version of this axe. Right, yeah. And I mentioned in that bonus episode that I was eventually going to have you guys fight him. And that's kind of how I was going to do that axe uh, if, if, we di- if we eventually got to that point. Right. So... So yeah, I, I did have some ideas in mind for how how to do this sort of thing in D anD D because I like it. I think it's it's such a cool item. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you have any ideas? So there's poke like pokeballs. Okay, you know it's like so yeah. you use that to capture creatures. You know, like something <laughs> capture something like sentient that. creatures. Yes, right. understood. And like I think there <laughs> there is a high level spell at least in third edition. I don't know if there's an equivalent in fifth edition or or any of the other games where like. It's like a high level, I don't know if it's conjuration or necromancy, I'm not sure. But basically you like you can trap something within like a like within like a material component, like a gem. I think it's like a gem or something. Uh if you're talking about soulbind, that is a ninth level necromancy spell. Yeah. From from third edition, yeah. Yeah. So it was and I think it was the idea is like you trap them in this this gem and then you can like break the gem and it summons them for like to do your bidding or something. Oh, actually, I don't know if I ever used this spell correctly. You draw the soul from a newly dead body is what oh. this spell does. And then you imprison it, and then they can't be brought back from the dead until you destroy the gem. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. I th- I th- see, I thought I maybe maybe it was something I was just making up like back in the day. Well, actually, hang on. Um, there is a 5th edition. There, there is another spell called Imprisonment. I th- no, I think it, I think imprisonment is basically just that. Like there are like different forms of imprisonment, but the idea is like you are just imprisoning something. Like one yeah. of one of which I think is you put them in a gem. Another one is like they are chained in a they are like chained up and like put deep underground or something. Uh okay, yeah. It looks like the fifth edition version has does have several different things. You can shrink someone down to a height of one inch and imprison them inside a gemstone or similar object. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it, th- there are some like super crazy high powerful like <laughs> mechanics for it. You yeah. Know, and th- like this I, one is abjuration uh, com- as compared to uh, Soulbind. Sure. Okay. But yeah, like yeah, you, you, <laughs> you could, it's like you fight a, uh, uh, an, an owl bear and you, you get it down to low hit points and you throw the, <laughs> you throw this thing at them and it traps them in and it like, I don't know. Maybe it's you know it won't be so simple and powerful. It could be like it gives you advantage on animal handling. Yeah, it it is hard to reconcile in in a game where you know the DM can can bring about actual implications of domination and slavery and such. It is kind of hard to reconcile something that we take for granted in a Pokemon game because in a Pokemon game you can't really. There's no option to let your Pokemon free and know that they're happy. You can let them free. That just means they're not part of the game anymore. <laughs> right. Um, so I get for the time being, if you just set that part aside, I feel like imprisonment <laughs> kind of is a similar thing. But w- one thing I want to I want to to address from the spell imprisonment. So it has a, like we said, it has a bunch of different uh, uses. Each use works differently and has a different material component. For example, the the minimus containment one, which is you shrink them down inside a gem, the material component is the gem. However, right. one of the other ones is called burial, and that is what the original, the third edition imprisonment did, where it, you trap them below the earth. The special component for this version of the spell is a small mithril orb. 
Oh, interesting. Like a certain ball <laughs> of the poke variety. Of the poke variety. So sure. if, if the game were built around these, you know, artifacts that used a weaker version of imprisonment that require the target to be of low health and so on. Yeah, sure. You know, there, there could be a way to, to make that work. So, uh, that you know that might make for an interesting adventure or something the the players come across like this orb uh-huh. that that has some sort of mechanism on it that when they hit it like uh, like this creature comes out of it <laughs> you know so yeah. like you can yeah. introduce like pikachu or something <laughs> into your D adventure what if you know but what if you like pikachu wasn't like an elect- electric mouse it was an actual like person like a character or something but it's oh just, like, jeff you just made this so much more problematic I get like he was a guy. He was a guy with with electric powers. <laughs> That'd be terrifying. So what if they used it on you? <laughs> what if a human gets put in a pokeball? Yeah, yeah. Which it which, which does always beg the question: like, do pokeballs work on people? And, and like, I don't think they do. At least, presumably, not, no. You know, I'm pretty right. sure like people have been hit with pokeballs in in like the show and stuff. They've been like, yeah, chucked at them. But you know, like what. You know what makes it what makes a Pokemon different from a human, and then like what's the lore behind that? I f- I feel like I feel like I've gone down this rabbit hill a hole before online, just cause like but like I like like what is the lore? Like I haven't really looked into it. Yeah, and like I feel you are like- asking you're asking a lot of tough questions that kind of have to be addressed if this is going to be a part of a game. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so so who knows? Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, another one I had come up with, uh, was, um, somewhat similar, uh, is Materia, uh, okay. from like Final Fantasy seven. Yeah. Uh, cause this was, this was something like I had like wished I had in, in, in D and D or something where it's like, it's a way to like, it was, it was like a physical form of a spell mm-hmm. kind of, it's like, okay, like w- wouldn't it be cool if I could like, if you could like store spells in these in this materia and so like you can just like you know like it's a it's a powerful item that lets you just cast that spell you know sure. it's just like it's it's like it, you know or could, you know you could you could just flavor it like that's kind of how scrolls are made or something yeah so, i've got an idea uh, for how this could work but go on um i mean it was it wasn't it wasn't much other than that just like a, it was some sort of spell storage or you know so, some way to get access to spells that you wouldn't normally just by if you had the if you had the right materia for it yeah, because the thing about materia is that it's it's not just casting spells. I mean, that is how most most of them are are used, I guess. Yeah. But there's also you know just ones that give you static bonuses, ones that enhance other materia. And I think that the the best way to uh, to make this work is to to overhaul how either magic item slots work or how attunement slots work. Mm-hmm. So um, in D anD D, you've got you know you've got you can wear one hat or helmet, you can wear one uh, cloak, you can wear one pair of gloves or gauntlets, you can wear one pair of boots, two rings, and so on and so on. Um, probably, if you were to sort of in- get rid of that entirely, and then say, because of how how Final Fantasy VII works, is your equipment, your armor, and your weapon each have a certain number of slots and that's what you put the material in. If you just kind of, if, if the DM does a little bit of work to assign different, I don't know, armors or weapons or whatever, different numbers of magic item slots, and then replace all of the magic items with materia, even materia that just do the exact same thing. Then for each, instead of having a cloak and a helmet, you just have a, you know, a materia of protection and a materia of, intelligence or whatever and then you put both of those in your weapon and now you have the benefits of a cloak of protection and a headband of intellect or whatever yeah um or if you if you do still want to have normal magic items you can maybe try to do that with attunement slots like you you have a certain number of attunement slots based on what other equipment you have and then the materia would each fill in one of those attunement slots sure yeah and then if you did want to have it be your casting spells from them, then have the magic items that you give the players have those magic items be uh, either consumables or um, just like once per day or once per whatever spell items. Right. So like a, a neck necklace of fireballs or something, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, really just like, like a, a way to kind of flavor the way that equipment works. Yeah. For the most part. But I mean, yeah, that's definitely one that, especially with uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake that came out a few months ago, I'm, that's definitely one that I think a lot of people nowadays would be, would be down for, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, any others that you got? Yeah. So uh, one that I was thinking of was the Mega Buster from uh, Mega Man. <laughs> sure. So it's a really simple item. It's basically just, you know, it's a projectile attack, but then you can charge it up for a few seconds. And the longer you charge it, it gets more powerful. I was trying to think of how to do this. But I was trying to think of how to do this while also not having it just be like, okay, you just have to spend the whole round just standing there and charging. What I would do is I would say... Let's say it's it does 1d6, you know, 1d6 force damage or something every time you use it. But similar to how I did the Leviathan Axe, if you spend your bonus action to charge it, each, each bonus action you spend adds a d6 to it. So if you were to this round, you know, maybe you just, you fire it once, you do a d6 damage, and then you start charging. Next round, you charge again. Maybe you do something else with your normal action. And then you charge it again and then charge it again and again. And eventually you can do a a regular attack that does 5d6 instead of 1d6. Mm -hmm. Or maybe increase the die, maybe set a cap of, you know, 3d10 is the cap instead of, you know, maybe they can't charge it for forever or something. But I just think that if you, you do make them cost, make it cost something. But I mean, then again, Mega Man can still run around and jump and climb on stuff while he's charging. He just can't attack. Maybe have a limitation on you can't you can't attack without spending everything you've built up. I, I don't know. Right. But it, it could work. I think it could be uh that could be an idea for a, a fun yeah. magic item. If I'm oh, what am I what am I thinking of? I think I'm thinking of uh second edition Pathfinder. There is like a monk like key blast ability. Okay. That that doesn't that does have a sort of like a charge up ability. Um to it because i know in in second in in pathfinder second edition you have like three actions okay that you can take per turn and like the those actions are sort of like a resource for doing like certain actions might take certain things might take one action like a spell you a spells usually take two actions right, right. Uh, you know moving takes an action a regular attack will take an action you know that sort of thing but like the the this key blast thing if you're using you can you know you can use just one action and it'll do a you know it'll do a blast or sure. if you use two actions it'll do like a cone or if you use three actions it'll do like a bigger cone with more damage yeah yeah the charge attack i don't think would be too difficult you just don't want it you want to make it worth it yeah th- that's why i didn't have it be you have to save up your action every round yeah because saving your action for four rounds and then doing an attack that might just miss. Right. Nobody's going to do that. That yeah. is not fun. Think of please true nobody out there. If any of you are developing a new magic item for D&D, please don't do that. It's not <laughs> fun. You know, th- I just think of think a true strike like you're you're yeah. you're basically like using an action to you know, you're using an action to power up an attack for later so in in a way like yeah. you're you know, it, it is a <laughs> It is a cantrip that takes an action to give you advantage on your next attack that could still miss. Yeah, yeah. Whereas like, you know, you, you, you know, or you could just attack twice in a, you know, two, two turns and, and in a have, row. And have the same potential for missing, but more potential for hitting. Yes. I mean, like, or more, more potential for damage dealing if you hit on both attacks. Yeah. Cause you can do twice the damage. Like, yeah, yeah. like it's, you're still getting, you're still rolling to a 20 sided die twice. <laughs> right. Like, so your odds of hitting are still the same. Yeah. Just I mean, over two rounds. There's the weird corner case that's like, no, 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 it's it's totally worth it. No, it's, but, it's just, I don't even, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I don't the, think the it only is. T- the only time it's worth it is if you only have one high level spell slot and you you really want to make sure you hit. Sure. I, I, but, but it's a cantrip. And, yeah, I know. And I like, know. It's, a, it's like, and you have to have spent the entire campaign so far with this cantrip. That's the cost you have to spend. Right. In order to make sure that this one high level spell hits. There are, you know, I know there are some classes that have ways of trading out cantrips and stuff. And, yeah. uh, but it's, it's just so, and they put it in, they put it in Baldur's Gate three. And I was like, okay, they made some changes to some of the spells in Baldur's Gate three. Like, mm-hmm. um, uh, what did they do? Like, uh, f- 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 
of Firebolt doesn't do as much damage, but it affects the environment, so it can actually light stuff on fire. Oh, okay. So it, it can do more damage. It has potential for more damage because then they're, like, standing in fire. Yeah, I can um, understand that. So, like, they, they made some adjustments that made it more, like, video game friendly and more tactical and, and more, you know, like, stuff like that. So, sure. I, so I, when I saw a True Strike in there, I'm like, okay, maybe they did something and it's not terrible. Because they made, like, <laughs> they made a few things bonus actions that aren't normally bonus actions. Like, I think jumping is a bonus action. Okay. In, in Baldur's Gate 3. So, I'm like, okay, they kind of made things a little bit more streamlined. So, maybe they made true strike a bonus action <laughs> and no it, no it's just the same thing it is just you you spend an action to get advantage on your next action <laughs> like yeah ugh, it's terrible yeah so a couple couple powerful ones i can think of are the chaos emeralds from okay from sonic the hedgehog yeah yeah what do you got uh i mean i don't i don't really know exactly how <laughs> you'd implement it because it's like because i don't know too much about Sonic the Hedgehog lore because if you go looking for that, you're gonna end up. Oh somewhere. yeah, don't listeners, please do, do not go searching for Sonic the Hedgehog anything. Like search for <laughs> the games, maybe. Do not dig deep on Sonic the Hedgehog unless that's your thing. I guess. Do um, not type in your name and then the Hedgehog into Google. Just don't do it. Wait, hold on. I'm doing it. Okay. I think I've looked this up before. <laughs> Yes, I have looked this up before. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff the Hedgehog. <laughs> it will bring up somebody's original character that they made. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no Jeff the Hedgehog is just like somebody this out there e- did that. He's just this emo looking guy. Like he's just oh, they're so... all all of them, Jeff. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> there really is probably all of them. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, I don't know really much about what the Chaos Emeralds do, except that when you get them all, you can turn into Supersonic or whatever. <laughs> um. So is was that the the mechanic you were thinking of is like having some sort of thing that if you get them all you become super powerful for a little while? Right. Yeah. It's a, just some sort of like you know tensor's transformation or something. Yeah. That's what I was gonna suggest. Yeah, that kind of thing. But like each one individually could have have its own thing. Like a, a mm-hmm. I mean, like I don't know if there's like an infinity stone style situation with the chaos emeralds. I just know that Doctor Robotnik Robotnik would like use them as a power source or something for his inventions. So yeah, who even at the knows? very least, they maybe are a power power source of some kind. So like they are just a powerful generic material component for like rituals and stuff. So like you could sure. have put them in the adventures as a you know a. A thing that you gotta go you gotta you, you go and you stop the necromancer from doing some evil thing and you find out he was you know he wasn't that strong but the reason why he was able to do this big ritual is because he had this powerful gemstone mm-hmm. and then you're like oh, okay and then you find them all and then it uses tensor's transformation on you or something i don't know yeah so i would say maybe look at um the uh the Rod of Seven Parts as an inspiration, which was, uh, it was an artifact in like second edition D&D or something where it was this rod, it was this very powerful staff that, it was a staff of law and it was used to kill a being of chaos. And so the combination of law and chaos caused the rod to shatter. And these seven pieces scattered across the multiverse, if you find any individual piece, they do, they each have like some unique power, but then if you get multiples of them and then connect them, they become more powerful than if you get all seven, you become super powerful or, or something. Uh, I don't know if there is an there. I don't think there is an official fifth edition version. There's a 95 cent PDF. Somebody or a pay what you want. Sorry. Pay what you want. PDF on DMS guild that somebody made. I might, I might pay 95 cents for that and, uh, and check that out. Cause that sounds cool, but that could be an example. Cause that is something you know, like the Dragon Balls, like the Chaos Emeralds, it is a thing of seven pieces that when you put them all together, something powerful happens. Maybe use that if you were looking to use the Chaos Emeralds, use that as an example of what that could be, I guess. Mm-hmm. Let me give a, an honorable mention, and it's actually two honorable mentions, either the Portal Gun or the Gravity Gun from Portal or Half-Life. Mm-hmm. And uh, the thing about these is that they seem really cool and they seem like, oh man, that would be so awesome to have in D&D. But two things. Number one, there's already D&D spells that do that. And number two, I don't think they really would be that cool in D&D because 
so much of this is the example of what I was saying of uh, when you use these in the game, it's because the game was built around that and using them in a game that doesn't use them isn't necessarily going to be a ton of fun. The portal gun is great in portal because it is a puzzle game built around using portals. In D&D, if you just have an ability that lets you essentially teleport from one place to another, I mean, I guess there are some ways you could utilize the momentum of falling, whatever, but then you're just, you're just emulating, you know, spells at that point. All you would be doing with flinging yourself using momentum is just, oh, a fly lets me do everything that that would do and then some. So I guess you could use a portal gun to like get into a stronghold and sneak in or whatever, but you can use magic to do that too. And it's a lot more powerful using magic. So it's cool. The portal gun is great. Don't get me wrong. I love the portal gun. It's one of my favorite things in a game ever. But in d and I don't really think it would be worth the trouble of, of, you know, what actually coming up with unique mechanics for it. Sure. Similarly, the gravity gun is really just a telekinesis spell. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can grab things, you can pull them to, you can throw them. That's 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 pretty much unless I'm mistaken, I haven't gotten very far in Half-Life 2, but unless <laughs> I'm mistaken, that's that's really all it does. It's just the game is built around it, so it uses it really well in those situations. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's it's a way to flavor a wand of telekinesis. I don't know. Sure. Sure. And then w- one more thing that I'll mention is really any kind of mech. You know, you've got your your Gundams, <laughs> you've got your your metals gear, your metals gear. Um, yeah, any kind of mech would be cool in D anD. d And there was actually uh, there is a DM's Guild supplement that Crit Academy did an episode on a long time ago called the Grease Monkeys Handbook. Uh, it is by Val Serene and Mogman Dabloon. I am doubtful as to whether those are real names or not. <laughs> but uh, it's from the sounds of it. I haven't bought this. It's it's 15 bucks for the PDF. But um, listening to Crit Academy talk about it, it, it seemed like a really cool, uh, really cool system that they had. And they had they had systems on how to make like a uh, basically just like a, a, a cyborg suit or like a power armor all the way up to like a gigantic mech that can, you know, fly through space and knock over buildings and such. Mm. So. Um, so yeah, check that out. I'll put that, in the, that link in the show notes. It would be cool to have some sort of a mech in D and D. This is a supplement that could let you do that if that's yeah. what you wanted. So, uh, Hey Gabe, I just, I just thought of a video game item that is very, very easy to implement into D and D. What's that? Pip boy. Okay. It, it's okay. just your character sheet. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to be like healing potion. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jeff, that would be really easy, right? <laughs> no, that's that's pretty good. If your character can see your character sheet, right? Yeah, your character is aware of its own <laughs> sheet because it, yeah, <laughs> with the pit when, boy. <laughs> uh, we guessed it on Crit Academy a few months ago, and I brought in for their unearthed tips and tricks. I brought in uh, the the monster manual as a um, as an artifact as like oh, a magic right, item. Yeah, and similarly, if your character had access to the metagame knowledge of how the game works Mm -hmm. that could have really powerful implications. So, right. Yeah. But you know, it, it it could make for an interesting time though. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I, I would, I would love to see somebody use that in the game. What if you're playing D and D you're just walking along, you're fighting goblins or whatever. And then one day you look in your pack and your character has a sheet of paper with their name on it and a list of all of their proficiencies and their, personality traits and the spells that they currently have prepared and so on. Right. <laughs> That's an interesting hook for an adventure. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, Gabe, I got a good one. Okay. What's that? The straight piece from Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> you throw it between your enemies and it destroys them instantly. <laughs> All right. We, we did it guys. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> <laughs> all right end of the episode we're done right. that's <laughs> we solved it we solved yeah. we solved the answer to the to this question <laughs> yeah if all the monsters are standing in a row you just th- you just throw it in a gap of between some of them <laughs> i mean well so what if there were spells or items or whatever that assuming you were playing on a battle grid mm-hmm. you could place things like that and 
it huh. would affect people next to them and so on. Yeah. You know what it makes me think of? Calculator from Final Fantasy Tactics. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to explain what it is or are you going to? Like, I can't remember all the mechanics of it. I just remember, like, Calculator was like this. It was one of the, it was one of the classes or jobs in, in Final mm-hmm. Fantasy Tactics. And yep. it involved, like, um... I forget if it had spells or if it just supplemented other spells. I, but it, it, it's I think it had spells that like went off of like the statistics of the character of like of the characters on the board. So what it did was um you in order to take this class, you basically had to have multi-classed into all of the other spell casting classes. Yeah. And all of the spells you got from those classes, you could cast as a calculator. But you couldn't just cast them normally. What you would do is you would you would assign various factors such as level and then a number such as three and then every enemy and then you would choose a spell and every enemy or player on the battlefield that had a level that was a multiple of three would be hit by that spell. So you could use that to hit all of the, you know, a whole bunch of enemies with flare but it might hit your own people too. You might cast a spell that heals one of your people, but it might heal the enemies too. And so the the various factors you could uh, you could use them on was there was there was level, there was what your current experience was, there was your height, I think. So like not your character's height, but where how high of a spot on the battlefield your character was standing. Oh right, yeah. And I think maybe like what your current charge time was, like where in the uh, where in the the line, where the in the initiative order your character was, you could be like whoever's initiative order is a multiple of five or something would get hit by whatever. Yeah. So it was an, a very interesting class, but it required a lot of a lot of knowledge and a lot of like a lot of planning to really use effectively. Yeah. I mean like the idea is like you if you if done right you could be casting one spell but hitting multiple targets from anywhere on the from battlefield. Any distance, yeah. Yeah, so like it had, you know, it had like, you know, like a lot of potential. It just was there yep. was a, it was a lot of work to get it to work right and it was de- like there, definitely an advanced class. Yeah, and, and there's room for error because you could be, you know, hit like hurting yourself or healing your enemy or something. Yeah. Um but like yeah, like a like a magical item that's like a Tetris board that depending on like the formation of the people on like on the grid, you mm-hmm. know, you could do s- specific things like, you know, maybe may maybe in the vein of the calculator, you could be, you know, shaping your spells a specific way to yeah. fit the you know to fit the needs of the battlefield. <laughs> I mean that that's a cool idea. It would be mm-hmm. a lot of work to make that you know, make that effective. But like, I, I like that idea. That's pretty cool. Oh, 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 like a, a necklace of fireball. Okay. So there's a, there's a necklace of fireball that gives you, uh, or isn't, isn't that what it is? It's just, what what is it called? I mean, the, the necklace of fireballs, it, you have a certain number of fireballs yeah. you can That's, use. That it. is what it's called. It's just called necklace of fireballs. Yeah. Okay. So, but like each fireball piece is a different shape. So it's like oh. you're not you're not hitting it's not a sphere. It is it is uh-huh. like this what this one is a cross shape. This one is a line. This one is a L piece, you know? So like All right, that's I really like that. That's really cool. Somebody go make this. Yes. Submit it to the Dragon's Board. <laughs> right. And they can even be different elemental types based on the colors or something, you know. Sure, sure. Because the different you know, the different colors of the Tetris pieces or what have you. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that that's really cool. All right, all right. Well, we've gone quite quite long on this uh, oh, on this topic, so I I think uh, I think that'll do it for this question. Um, uh, thank you, Stiltskin Coop eighty four. We got a lot more out of that question than I than I thought we would. Hmm. Um, so that'll do it for our regular questions for today. But we do still have our social media questions. Uh, we'll try to make this quick. Our last social media question was: Does your character have any living family? If so, what family members do they have, and how, if at all, have they come into play? Uh, do you, did you have an answer? Oh, right. I had, uh, Elijah's father. Yes. Like he, he basically had a falling out and then eventually he like, they, like you had, you had the dad uh, come back and like join like the big epic fight at the end. Yeah. Yeah. There was a whole party that was kind of 
devoted to your character. It was your character's dad. It was your previous character <laughs> and the character that uh, the doppelganger that took your character's place. <laughs> right. Yeah. What a what a fun bunch. <laughs> yeah. So what would they talk about? That's what well, I yeah. want to know. <laughs> um, Wouldn't it be funny if like the doppelganger became the son that the dad always wanted or oh, something like snap. that? So your your dad he cared about you even he didn't learn his lesson and start caring about his son again he just started caring about his fake son right yeah yeah <laughs> because the doppelganger was like you know part, partly evil like he what he wanted to like he wanted to live that life because like like the dad was like rich or something he was like he was like this big sure. he, he was just like he just wanted he wanted to take advantage but at the same time be like um Maybe the the doppelganger is waiting until he can uh, off your character's father and then take his place. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, and I, I think I had my, my character Ichi because I haven't I haven't really played any characters with family in a while. My character Ichi had parents, and I wrote a short story about him finding them. I guess. Yeah. Uh, so over on Facebook, Sean M says my knowledge cleric Alexander is a Canadian accented fear bulg Indiana Jones. He routinely tries to avoid danger and supporting the party from the back of the room. He's been pulled into an eldritch horror campaign and is now trying to undo the evil. The party just learned that he'd head off to a dangerous archaeological dig despite having a wife and kids at home. He assures his fellow party members that his family is supportive of his work, but if the PCs ever meet his family, they may want to leave out how they're currently in a jail of dangerous, timeline-changing snake people who worship an elder evil. They had to be snakes. There you go. Colin W. says, My mastermind rogue was supposed to take over his family's holdings after the death of his father, but he decided to actually turn this title to his younger brother. But he's begun to suspect that his brother's wife is trying to manipulate his brother to absorb their household into hers. My character has not been able to convince the younger siblings of this, so he's gone out into the world to collect evidence of his sister-in-law's shady dealings. Mm. There you go. That's some good uh, some good intrigue going yeah. on in there. Uh, Jake F says, my current character is divorced from his spouse who remains his commanding officer in the city watch. His patrol partner is his adopted dragonborn cousin whose family he considers to be his own. Our current adventure has my character's cousin wrongfully imprisoned by corrupt authorities in the city tied in with a gang or slave traders. Mm. There you go. These people got some interesting stuff going on. <laughs> Uh, Alistar the Minotaur on Reddit says, Krilla the War Priest was a prince to the Merfolk Empire. However, he was the 14th in line for the throne. His auntie, the queen, who barely recognized his existence, led the Merfolk people into a civil war and through the use of blood magic, created super soldiers. Krilla ended up having to kill her with what amounted to a magic bomb, destroying a city block in the process. He then helped install his uncle, a far more intelligent and less rash man, as regent while he became a cardinal in the merfolk religion, living out the rest of his days in blissful ignorance, indulgence, and general sin. A more perfect ending couldn't have been written. Man, people so. got a lot of stories for their family. My, my characters are usually like, it's a ranger. His parents were killed by ogres. I now get a plus two against ogres. Yeah, Done. <laughs> pretty much. Uh, I don't think we got any on Twitter. Got a few over on Discord. Uh, Peace Story Pancake says, I usually make a concerted effort to have some sort of family. Favorites in no particular order. One, Len in Zweihander, a peasant turned camp follower who lost his eldest son in a war and had four younger children at his sister's place. GM ignored them and brought his dead son back to life, though. <laughs> Number two, my first Blades in the Dark character one day disappeared with his daughter and made an enemy for life in his ex wife. Keeping his daughter safe in a city of crime was his number one priority. And then number three, uh, Fion Foxglove in our Patreon game, the third child of nine, has as much love as she has disdain for her gigantic family. She does send about a third of all of her earnings back home, though. And that has to count for something, right? <laughs> Dustin says, now that you make me think about it, I don't think I have ever had a character's family play an active role in their life. I have played the disowned, the orphaned, the widower, but I've never played the married or well-loved. Maybe that says something about me. Nope, just a coincidence. Nothing to see here. Move along. <laughs> that does remind me of the 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 couple character idea oh, yeah. that you had. Yeah, I would love to play that character sometime. Um, for anybody who has not, I've mentioned it a couple times, but if you haven't heard that episode, uh, I mentioned a, a character I, I thought of where it was a, a husband and wife, 
And whenever one of them went adventuring, the other one stayed at home and like tended the bar or whatever. They owned a bar or something. And they were both the first, the same class, but they were different specialties. So like one of them would go on an adventure and then the next adventure, the other one would be there and they'd be like, oh man, we need some, we need, you know, a defender up here. And then the, the husband's like, dude, I'm offense. What are you talking about? I, I don't even have a shield or something, (laughs) but then also they would each know different things. So one of, you know, they'd have different, like different skills and such, but also they might be on an adventure and be like, Oh wait, what happened with that key? Or, or what was that puzzle that we solved? And then they look at the wife and she's like, I don't know. I wasn't there. I was, (laughs) I was working the bar. What are you talking about? Right. Yeah. (laughs) So talk to my husband about that one. (laughs) Right. Um, Floofy Shoop says one of our most recent play by post games had a dozen PCs and we were all members of the same family. It was a nice change of pace. Oh, I I think that sounds like a really good idea. That's it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, Debrasaur says, let's see here. Tiefling fiend warlock, whose patron was her devil mother in hell, who she's an intern for trying to get into the family business. (laughs) The sister PCs that run with different parties, but keep crossing paths. (laughs) <laughs> the I got bored, so I started adventuring wizard whose parents are dukes of a farming area and the bard whose privileged dad killed her prostitute mom to save his name. Said bard pretends to be a previous rich wizard, but doesn't spell the name correctly. Um, I had I made a character for we played with Crit Academy once and I made a character that was he was like the nephew of the the king's court wizard or something. And he had, he was aspiring to take over as court wizard, but in order to do so, the current court wizard told him like, no, you got to go adventuring. Like you have to go get some real life experience. Yeah. So we didn't play for very long, but that was, that character's motivation was, uh, family, uh, family based. Right. Um, and we have a, a new person, J nine Larison. I think I'm pronouncing that right. In our British Isles inspired Pathfinder game I'm playing. Uh, They then give a name that I had to comment. The name is spelled C-A-O-I-M-H-E. So like a dumb American might think it's pronounced like cow me or something, Hmm. but it's pronounced Kiva. Okay. Kiva. So Kiva, an Irish half-orc paladin whose family legacy looms large over her life. Her orcish grandfather had to flee Russia due to a failed attempt to assassinate the Tsar and start a communist revolution. He escaped to Ireland and brought his ideology with him. He started a communist community and had tons of children, so I drew my DM an entire elaborate family tree, including cousins and siblings, aunts and uncles, all with Celtic names just as unpronounceable as Kiva. (laughs) <laughs> when Kiva isn't spending her time in game giving inspiring speeches to the local peasants about the dialect and urging them to seize the means of production, she is spending time with her numerous family members. Even though this is a zombie heavy game, I'm sure my DM won't use any of this large family tree to torture my character, right? That would just be cruel. <laughs> yeah. Stiltskin Koopa 84 added, uh, should I tell them? because yes Uh, all right so that was our last social media question our next social media question is do you own any niche or novelty dice what are your favorite or least favorite so i should uh um i want to give a small correction and also possibly a small rant about our last episode i was i was talking about there was a um one of the i think it was the one of the barbarian archetypes in uh, Tasha's oh, Cauldron of Everything. The D3? Has a, I think that's a D3. And I, I think at the time I was I was complaining about the D3 and I was like, that's stupid. Who ev- You can't even buy a D3. Two things I want to say. First off, I realized while editing, third edition had D3s. Uh, there were a few pa- there were a few um, cantrips that did a D3 damage, like Ray of Frost mm. was a D3 damage. Um, I, I want to clarify and say, okay, yes, that is a thing. It's still stupid. And then number two, you can buy D3s. I, sh- I don't know why I said you couldn't, because you can. You absolutely can. You can go on Amazon right now and buy a D3. However, they're stupid. They're very <laughs> stupid. <laughs> like, they have rounded edges. You know, it's it's like a, a basically take like a ball, squish three flat edges onto it, and that's a D3. And it's just, it's stupid. There's There are stupid dice. You can even buy a D5. I think I said something about D5. Like, oh, why don't you just use a D5? Right. There are some stupid dice out there. They exist. That doesn't mean they're not stupid. I just wanted to head anybody off. 
because that episode just went out today. I just want to make sure that nobody's like, oh, but there are, you can buy a D3. Okay, yes. I realize that now. I don't know why I said you couldn't. They're still stupid. <laughs> don't use D3s for anything. Yeah. Use a D4. It's only one number different. The the D10, a lot of people complain about D10s, like when we had uh, Tom Russell on for uh, an interview that we did, like in the first year of the podcast. Uh, the topic of uh, a D10 came up as being a stupid die because it's it's a non-platonic solid, meaning the sides are not um, the sides are not all uh, like equilateral or whatever. Like the, right, the sides yeah. are not a a singular shape. I mean, I guess I don't know. I don't know what term I'm trying to. Come, yeah, I come think up equal here, equilateral. I like it's it doesn't they don't have equal sides. The, yeah, like it, it is face... not a a standard geometric shape. Right, yeah. and. I, I definitely understand that. I would say the reason that a D10 is still in use, however, is because it's very useful for percentiles. Right, every game yeah. everywhere can use percentiles for something. If it weren't for the percentile, percentiles, I don't think anyone would use a D10 for anything. Similar to the D3, don't use a D3. If you're going <laughs> to use a D3, why don't you throw in like, a, I don't know, a, a D... I was about to say D4, but that is a thing. A D5, because it's half of a D10. <laughs> Throw in a D50. Get, 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 do the percentiles and just divide it in half. You should something. talk. You should, you should talk to to Games Workshop about uh about Warhammer. Yeah, because it's like it's 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 D3s and D6s. That's 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 all Warhammer is, and like you just have a yeah. ton of six sided die, but then a lot of times you're rolling that and it's a D3 because you're sure you know, sure. One and two is one, two and three is, you know, <laughs> so on. And I, I will say that, uh, uh, like about an hour before we recorded this, Dustin on the Discord, because we were talking, because this episode just came out where I was complaining about D3s. Uh, Dustin has, he posted pictures, he has a D3, he has a D5, he has a D14, and he has a D24. <laughs> and like... I get it. I have a D30 and I have a D60 and a D100. And I think all of those are stupid. Even the D100 is stupid. Uh-huh. Like, don't get me wrong. They're st- they exist, but they are still stupid. So D14. anyway, <laughs> not oh to goodness. editorialize too much, but do any of you I don't think that I'm calling any of you stupid. If you have a D3 and you love it, awesome. I'd love to hear about it. Tell me why you love it. I would <laughs> love to hear why it is not stupid. <laughs> go ahead and let me know <laughs> i'm waiting <laughs> <laughs> i guess i guess so so yeah uh hopefully our listeners have had good experiences with some of these <clears throat> stupid dice and hopefully we've got some they've got some stories to to share yeah so uh, anyway <laughs> do, do you have any novelty dice jeff novelty dice no um I'm trying to think if i have any like dice with just odd faces on them or something but no I, you know i i have i have my i have my several sets of green colored dice <laughs> sure of, and of, I, I would i would even include niche or novelty dice i would even include stuff like uh fate dice or like fudge dice or whatever they're called yeah um you know stuff like that i would even be fine with that just any any kind of dice that you that you have that you think are just really cool which is your favorite what's your least favorite Right. You think D3s are also stupid like I do. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that'll do it for our, our questions for today. But before we close out, let's uh, let's wind down. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> let's remember those who have come before us, who have made the world a better place through their sacrifice as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. Today's funeral pyre was submitted by Alessander on Reddit, and uh, they they gave me a one sentence funeral pyre, and then I was so intrigued I had to get more information. So the it'll be longer than that, but the the one sentence they gave me was I've only had one character death so far, and it was a magic powered roller coaster accident. <laughs> I mean, come on, I, I gotta know more than that. Oh my goodness. So they then went on to clarify, my character had a variation of wild magic due to circumstances surrounding how he gained access to it. And because he had a negative wisdom modifier, I decided to play him as having less than ideal common sense. So he kept the magic a secret from the other party members who consistently rolled very badly on insight whenever I had to come up with an excuse for the wagon bursting into flames, etc. 
and didn't get help, making the magic's chaotic nature a bit of a health risk, in addition to the random side effects from its use. Anyways, one other quirk of my character was he would often seek out things like roller coasters and zip lining whenever a town was visited, and one such town was having a magic competition. The roller coaster was powered by the rider's magic, requiring periodic wild magic checks. And after some very poor rolls and a crit fail, my character became the epicenter of a wild magic tornado while riding the roller coaster, causing it to break apart, some magic wolves to start attacking people, and a few other random things. Oh no. So, yeah, that's... <laughs> Okay, I've got a great send-off. Uh, uh -huh. Let's raise a glass to Alessander for this roller coaster of a story. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Clink. I was about to just say that. I was like, no, no, I got to say, I can't, I can't just say that as a non sequitur. I, I have to use it for the, yeah, don't, yeah. I can't say that and then come up with another send off. Uh, yeah. You can't you know. give those, you can't give them a freebie like that. You know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. I think that'll do it for today to submit questions for us to discuss items for the dragon's horde or stories for the funeral pyre. Please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned in the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. You can join the discussion on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Reddit, we're on our Interparty Discord, we're on Twitter at InPartyConflict. Check those out for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. You can find us on the podcatcher of your choice. We're on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you want to support the show monetarily, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We have a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is a YouTube channel where you can watch us play video games, or you can join me over at uh, twitch.tv slash tiltedtortle to uh, watch me play video games live. Yes. Also, head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show, what you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games, courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time... Oh, Gabe, here comes the drop. Put your arms up. Oh, come up. Oh. Woo!